Yeah. <clears throat> Hang on a second. All right, there we go. Yes. Yeah. Can hear you. Good. Perfect. Well, Pin, this, yep. this is our friend, our friend Travis that we were telling you about, and he he's really good at answering uh, the questions that that you were having. And so maybe. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so Tra appreciate well, you joining, Travis. Sure. So yeah, we can we can just leave it to be a, an open discussion. Um, so I know, Pin, you want to talk about um, Romans chapter three and four. And, and some other things as well. So, I mean, we can, we'll just kind of sit yeah. back. And so, back. yeah. So, um, <laughs> now when we spoke last time, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned just to go, one suggestion was just to go read some, some things in the Book of Mormon and, uh, and whatnot. And I told you I had read a good bit before, but when I had read before, I just started at the beginning and it was a lot of narrative and that type of thing. So what I actually decided to do was to go to the LDS site and look at kind of statement of faith and follow um, references, all some interesting things. And that's really kind of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, but also I mentioned Romans three and four, just to relate them. You know, we talked about some of the things last time to do with the Trinity and different things like that. Um, but if you if you got your resources with you, if you look at Alma eleven, is it is that how you say it? Alma. Sure. It's Alma. Alma. So there's a conversation, and you guys can tell me what this is about. Um, there's a conversation between uh, two folks or two beings. Uh, who are those? Let's see. It's um. Let me see. Amalek and Zizram. Correct. Who who are they? Yeah. Amalek is a, a missionary companion of Alma. Okay. And Zizram is a, a lawyer. Okay. So um it's, in, it's interesting that the um the questioning is there is there one true living god uh is there more than one god he says no uh how do you know these things the angel told me um who is he that shall come son of god okay and he said unto him yes um he says he shall save uh shall he save people in their sins and uh and that's the thing that kind of stood out to me is um the response here is no he shall not it's impossible for him to deny his word i think later on here it says it says again he shall not save people in their sins um yeah i think verse 37 says unto you again that i uh, cannot save them in their sins for i cannot deny his word and he has said unto uh that no clean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven no unclean thing and that's what all was pretty interesting to me, um, which I would say that I think I completely agree that no clean, no unclean thing can enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> is that is that consistent? You guys agree with that? Is that with the right? The I mean, we're going to agree. We're going to agree with whatever the Book of Mormon says. Right. Okay. So I think our uh, our question has to be: If are we unclean? Am I unclean? Are you unclean? I know I'm unclean. I can speak for myself. What, do you guys consider yourself unclean? What I tell our team is before you can get the Mormon saved, you got to get them lost because they believe that they're the true Christians. They are more saved, if you want to use that term, than we are. Then I'll ask the question, would you say that you have forgiveness of sin? 
And depending on which answer you get, you can go in any number of, de of directions. One of the answers that I've been getting more recently than in the past is, yes, I believe I am forgiven. And I'll ask the question, how did you get forgiven? And they will say, I was forgiven because I asked for it. You can move on to another, uh, another verse, Alma 11, 37. Actually, Alma chapter 11 is my absolute favorite chapter in all, in, in the whole Book of Mormon, because there are a number of really, really good issues there that you can deal with and help the Mormon to understand a few things. Verse 37, And I say unto you again that he cannot save them in their sins, for I cannot deny his word. And he hath said that no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can ye be saved except ye inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, ye cannot be saved in your sins. So I will ask the question, what condition do you need to be in before he will save you? Sometimes Mormons don't understand this. I'll say, well, you can't be in your sins, right? Right. So what's the opposite of in? Out. You've got to be out of your sins. You've got to be out of your sins before he will save you. Now, I've had many Mormons tell me, but Keith, if I can be out of my sins, then what do I need Jesus for? And I say, you know, that's a great question. And if my church taught that, I'd be asking more questions. Because that just doesn't make sense, does it? Get out of my sins so that Jesus can save me? And we'll, we kind of go off of this outline without opening up a Book of Mormon or whatever, because I don't want them to, I don't want to tip them off that I know a lot more about Mormonism than they probably do. So we just, we sit back, we take what they say, we listen, and, uh, and, we were, we were really getting hard, uh, it was hard pressed to get the, these, these Mormon missionaries to understand this point. And at this time, Becky was leading most of our conversation, and I was just really thinking and praying, Lord, they're not getting it. And I can't, you know, I can't whip out Moroni 1032 on them, I, I just can't do that, because, um, you know, they, they don't know what we know about Mormonism. So we're asking these leading questions, and it really wasn't getting anywhere, and they kept focusing on, we only need the best we only need to do the best we can. And I said, Well well let me ask you a question. How many of the commandments do we have to keep? All of them. I said, Well, how often do we have to keep them? They said, All the time. I said, So we've got to keep all the commandments all the time. And they said, That's right. And I said, Well, then I don't get it. Oh, that's a big surprise. She says, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you're, you're telling me that you only need to do the best that you can do, right? Right? And I said, so then you really don't need to keep the commandments, do you? This guy sucks. If they think they can't keep the commandments, that they only need to do their best, then what they're really saying is, I don't have to keep the commandments. You guys follow that point? They understood that. And it stopped right there. What do you mean by unclean? Well, whatever the standard is to enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, right, but what is unclean? What do you mean by unclean? Because the text has a specific meaning. An unclean thing is an unrepentant sinner. Okay. So... So no unrepentant sinners can enter the kingdom of heaven. That's right. the context of the Book of Mormon. All right. Now, so what makes them clean? Repentance and the atonement. Okay. Well, at this at this then, time, keeping the law of Moses, because they're they're living under the Mosaic covenant. Right. 
Do you mean, so I they're, mean they're, what, they're, they're living the law? They're living the law of between Moses. the laws of Moses. Well, they're they're living the law of Moses. This is a group of Jews who are living the law of Moses because this is a hundred years before Christ was born. Okay. So they would still be keeping the law of Moses. <clears throat> so and uh I'm not sure what to do with my hands. So you're oh, talking about you're talking about the context of the passage is Jews who are keeping the law of right. Moses. Yeah. So everything no, that I, they're talking about has to do with the context of Jews looking forward to a Messiah who is yet to come. Right. So what what about repentance? What do you say? You said the atonement and repentance. So what about that makes makes somebody unclean? I mean, clean, pure. I will pay the debt if you will free the debtor of his contract so that he can keep his possessions and not go to prison. You demanded justice. Though he cannot pay you, I will do so. You will have been justly dealt with and can ask no more. It would not be just. If I pay your debt, will you accept me as your creditor? <laughs> oh, yes. Then you will pay the debt to me, and I will set the terms. It will not be easy, but it will be possible. I will provide a way. You need not go to prison. And so it was that the creditor was paid in full. He had been justly dealt with. No contract had been broken. The debtor, in turn, had been extended mercy. Both laws stood fulfilled. Because there was a mediator, justice had claimed its full share, and mercy was fully satisfied. Unless there is a mediator, unless we have a friend, the full weight of justice, untempered, unsympathetic, must fall upon us. There is a redeemer, a mediator, who stands both willing and able to appease the demands of justice and extend mercy to those who are penitent. For he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law and to all those who have a broken heart and contrite spirit. And unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Well, the, the atonement, Christ's atonement, is what provides us the capacity to be cleansed from our sins. Okay, all right, there we go. What what do you mean by capacity to be cleansed? I I I mean, do you know do you know what the atonement is? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm Okay. I'm, what do you mean by capacity to be clean? What is, well, I, is that what does that infer? Is it is that infer something on us? It the capacity to be clean would be that I have the ability to be clean. That's just the way I would receive that statement. Is that not what you well, mean? Well, yeah, I, I have the ability to be cleansed. Sure. Okay. Well, how do you become cleansed then if if, if it's under your ability through, to be through, cleansed? Through the atonement. Or are, you cleansed? atonement. Are, you cle are you cleansed by the atonement or do you have the ability to be cleansed by the atonement? I am capable. Both. I, I am capable both. of being cleansed by the atonement. And the atonement has the capacity to cleanse me. But I have to repent of my sins. You serious? I just, I just told you that a moment ago. Right. Okay. To receive, to receive the benefits of the atonement, I have to repent. Except Jesus okay, Christ. Okay, so can you go, can you expound on re what your repentance is? <clears throat> is that, is that, uh... Or I guess I, sh I should say this. Let's say you um, you repent today. 
because I would say, well, let's back up. Do, would you agree that repentance is an ongoing thing? Well, just a okay. sin is an ongoing thing. Yeah. So repent. Yeah, repentance is continual. Yeah. Right. We we don't believe that we just repent at one point in time and that we're forensically okay. so justified let's say, at that point let's say in you, time. And right, right. We, we we believe in sanctification, not not justification in the way that most Christians do. Okay. See this this now we're going to get to where we. Yeah, you could actually out. just you could actually just explain your theology and just say this is what I believe. Do you guys believe the same thing? And I can say no. Well, we're going to get to that when we look at Romans three and four because this is the theology. But well, I'm Roman, to you're, it's, well, you're, you're going well, to explain on. your understanding of Romans no, three no, and four. No, no, I'm going to. We're going to look at the text. It's not anybody's okay. understanding. It's going to be the text. Well, so, yeah, no, it's going to be your understanding of. Romans I'm trying to decide four. what I'm honestly, seriously, I'm honestly trying to decide if, if there's even any kind of uh, a, a distinction, because so far between, I don't see a, I don't see a distinction between what between you and I. Oh, OK. I mean, I'm not trying to yeah. make one where none exists. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to see where if there's a distinction. So what I was asking on the uh, repentance. um. Just this, this is a hypothetical question, just to understand the full concept of the repentance and the sanctification. Let's say that uh, that let's say you repent, you've repented today, and we continually fall short of God's standard. I, I think we could all probably agree with that. I hope. Um, and then you don't repent until sometime next week, but between now and then, you pass. So. What does that mean for you? You belong with me. I, I don't understand that question. You what die do you mean? if you if you don't if you've done things since <clears throat> the last time you repented and you die and you hadn't had a chance to repent again or you haven't taken the opportunity. Well, that's to not how again. that's not how repentance works. But okay, okay. Right. now explain it then. Repentance is an ongoing process. Repentance is a change of heart. It's it's a change in nature. A repentant person will right. repent. So if I die with, quote, unrepented of sins, we don't believe that the determination as to our eternal condition is predicated at the time of our death. There we go. Where, where, when is it, though? We, we believe that we, we, we're starting a process of changing becoming well, you had, well, perfect if you didn't well so like if i'm walking a path if i'm hold walking, on, hold on, hold on, hold wait, on. wait i'm going to explain it to you if i if i choose to walk a path and i am walking that path whether i'm stumbling along that path or i'm continuously walking that path whether i've fallen on the path or not makes no difference i'm still remaining on the path i pick myself up i keep moving forward if I'm on that path when I die, then why would I stop walking that path? My nature is such that I walk that path. Well, I am headed in that path, direction. Is being on the path the standard or is being at the end of the path the standard? Being on the path. Well, being on the because path. Because you can't you, you can't make it to the end of the path in this life. That's not possible. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You win. So well, that's. I mean, and where do, where does of, the point where does the point of becoming a, becoming clean come in? What is the moment? So if uh, we we're still we're still in alignment. By the way, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure complete clarity. Um, and this is why I wanted to to ask this a minute ago before we got on the path, because now I kind of forgot the, what you had actually said. You're not the only one with gifts. Uh, relating to this, but. So uh, there's a moment where you repent originally, the first true repentance, right? Oh, I suppose so. I, I don't. I don't know that there's a pinpointed specific moment, but well, Jesus says you have to be I born again. You, so let's can we say born again when you're born yeah, again? But we, we, yet yeah, we don't believe that that's a a, a one time. Thing. like repentance being born isn't again a, is not a one-time thing so like so hang repentance on is being is, hang on hang on hang on is let, 
uh, let me try. I want to try to um, get to this this one point. Is being born again a one time thing? It, it, no. It, so you're born again multiple times. There can be only one. No, it's a process. Okay. This is a process. It's a process. It's a process. Thing being spiritually reborn is a process. So how do you complete the process? And who do you know that has completed the process? We don't complete it in this life. And Jesus well, completed how... it. <laughs> he completed it when? When he was resurrected. Mary. Rabboni. Touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Okay. You're, you're, okay. Oh no, I don't know what I'm doing. There's a, there's a, a merging of justification and sanctification going on. Do you, do you see that? I, I, I don't know how you're understanding those terms. So no, okay. I don't. Well, do you, I don't know that. Justification, the legal term justification. You're justified. Let's say you, you are accused of committing a crime and you are, justified that you did not commit a crime in court right that's a legal it's a legal thing you're made you're you're made right uh everything that guy just says bull thank you you're made whole you you're justified or let's say that there's a a self-defense situation and and you well, know if you're if you're if you're just if you're justified in a court for example what's declared is that you're innocent of the crime you're not justified. You're just declared not guilty. Well, let's well let's go back to the example of self defense. Well, that you could be tried for uh, for murder, and it was actually self defense. Self defense is a just you're justified in the use of force. For example, okay, you're made well, right. Yeah, self defense to, is to, a to, defense to the to the crime. Right. Of and that, that would happen. That would happen in court. Maybe not in a case, but through the court system, it's it's a legal term. Justified. It means there's no wrong here. You, you're I'm, not. I'm not, seen I'm as not wrong. very familiar. I'm not very familiar with legal terms, so I'm not. Okay. I'm not sure. Well, it, it's you're not you're not seen as wrong. You're not in. There's no conflict with the law. There's no conflict with the authorities. I know, but if, if you if you if you kill somebody in self defense, you're not guilty of any crime. It's right. not that you're, you were justified; you're simply not guilty. Well, of you're any crime. seen as justified, right? It's justified is a standing before the law. Is a but, it's a right standing before the law. If you do everything right all the time, you're justified, right? You're justified in your living. If everything is always up with the law, you're you are a just person. You're justified in your righteousness. Well, you just haven't committed any legal infractions and aren't guilty of any crimes. Right. You're justified as a righteous person, a just person. That's you what just justification are, is. You just are a, a person who doesn't commit crimes. That's just your nature. Oh, that's what justification is, okay? Okay. And since you, you don't if want that's to acknowledge what you say. the term, well, what is it to you then? Well, if that's how, if that's how you're defining it. No, that's how it is. That, that's what it is. What is your definition? Of I don't have a I don't have a specific definition of justification. Well, you I'm probably should. Well, you probably should have a specific definition because it's mentioned I don't know how many times in the scriptures. So why is it such a difficult term? And why I, why would you not have a clear definition of justification? I I, I don't because I, I just don't. Okay. Why do I have to? Because this is an important doctrine. If why? we're going to rely on because it is the central key to relying on Christ for our righteousness to be pure, to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
So a person, if, if a person doesn't understand the definition of justification, they can't be made righteous. Um, well, okay. And that's not the case. So do you think? Well, duh. Everybody, you think everybody nope. that Paul taught understood the, the concept of justification as you're describing? Well, it? if he, if Paul taught him, yes, they did. If Paul taught him, yes, they did. But if you're talking about somebody who has been born again, has has, so if, uh, has repented, hang on a second, and they don't understand any doctrine, they are they're also justified whether they know it or not. Right. That's not the point, but you, well, let's that, not that throw, was, that, that's my I'm not, point. My point well, is I'm not I don't talking have to, to listen. Hey, hey, hang on. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. You come right. here as a representative of this of your doctrine. Okay, so I expect well, I'm, more. I'm just a member. Of, I'm just I a expect, member of my church. Well, then why are you here? If you if look, I expect more out of this conversation than you just say. Well, I don't know what it is. And um, well, let's let we need to just pause for a second because this is not where this is not where we want to go. I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to find out if we even have any distinction between. And so far, okay. it's really, 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 really close. Well, what do you what and, do you believe is the so let's get the into relevance it. of justification? Justification is everything. So simple. Maybe you need a refresher course. Hey, it's all ball bearings nowadays. It's the it's the central core foundation of the gospel our, of Jesus Christ. In our, you see, the apostolic proclamation was repent and believe. It wasn't. This is what God has done for you. The centrality of our preaching is always the cross, isn't it? So uh, the apostle Paul says, "I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified." God the Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, visited young Joseph Smith and initiated what would become a virtual flood of revelation linked with divine power and authority. In these revelations, we find what might be termed the core doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ reestablished upon the earth. Jesus Himself defined that doctrine in these words recorded in the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. This is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. And the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father and me. And I bear record that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. And whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved. And they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. And whoso believeth not in me and is not baptized shall be damned. And whoso believeth in me believeth in the Father also. And unto him will the Father bear record of me, for he will visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine. And whoso buildeth upon this buildeth upon my rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. This is our message, the rock upon which we build, the foundation of everything else in the Church. Like all that comes from God, this doctrine is pure. It is clear. It is easy to understand, even for a child. With glad hearts, we invite all to receive it. In our religion, we don't use that term. We use the word tone or atonement. Well, the atonement has been made. Justification is an Sins effect have been of, atoned for. The justification is an effect of the atonement. It is the central effect. Let's start. Let's just go through Paul, okay? 
and uh, what we need to do to go through Romans here, because how familiar, I mean, I hope, surely you're pretty familiar with Romans. I've read it a couple of times, sure. Okay. Well, Romans could be said to be Paul's um, most comprehensive, systematic of the gospel. If you said the gospel of Paul, the gospel according to Paul, that would be Romans. It's very systematic, top to bottom. Starts in Romans 1, starts talking about general revelation, natural revelation, where God has revealed himself to everyone, not just the Jews, in nature. Goes into chapter 2, talking about people who don't have the Mosaic law, don't have the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and uh, the other law that is <clears throat> this added to the uh, the Hebrew, the Jews, the Jews that if you conduct yourself as a moral person, you are a law unto yourself, which means that there is a moral standard that we all know. We all know it because we do it. Now we see this with skeptics. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand that, that phrase. If we conduct ourselves as a moral person, we're a law unto ourselves. What does that mean? That mean, well, I'm explaining it. We all know skeptics and, and atheists, and people say, well, there is no God, um, but they also conduct themselves as if there's a moral code, a, a transcendent code that is outside of us and creation. Oh, really? Because if you said, is it okay to rape a child, they would say no, but they're not consistent well, because they have no foundation for that. So that's- Why, why not? It's, it's socially unacceptable, and it's it's- well, it's illegal according to laws this nation to do that. Well, God is the standard of morality, not the not the nation or the culture or the laws of the city or state or county or wherever you are. The moral standard well, for creation is God. Well, morality becomes relatively subjective as it relates to people. So it does not. But uh, no, no, God yeah, is, morality God is the moral standard for all creation. No, that's a theological position, and I appreciate that, but that's not reality. No, that's, that's not actually what's oh, happening. Oh, no, that is, uh, well, you're just, uh, you might as well call yourself an atheist, to be honest with why, you. Why is that? Because you're denying God. No, I can, deny... I can appreciate, I can appreciate someone's theological position, I can hold my own theological positions, and I can also recognize the objective fact that societies throughout history have established certain codes, irrespective of whether they're religious or not. It's not about religion. There's a let me, let me read it to you. <clears throat> well, for well, for example, in 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 Greek culture, philosophical views were divorced from their religious observance. They didn't receive their morality from their gods. They received their morality through philosophy. They had a philosophical system that was robust, and that's what determined. Where do you think it. the philosophy comes from? Logic is also from God. Well, yeah. If you want to say that. Anything a person thinks comes from God, if that's your position, then then sure. Well, that's truth. But that's, that's not. Reality. Well, that's that's let's not look reality. At what, that's a let's theological look at how, position. No, it's not. That is reality. That's a theological if, position. The, the idea that there even is a God is a theological position and is a no, belief system that a person has. Aristotle got to an a an unmoved mover and a necessary being in philosophy. Is, that's a simple. That's theme. fine. That's and other theism. And other, that, and other philosoph philosophers disagree with Aristotle, and, and they're and it. they're wrong. You got it. But all right, let, let's let's see what Paul said about this though, because it, let's get back to if we're going to say we believe that the scriptures are revelation from God, then that's the ultimate source of everything and, and what do you mean by foundation. revelation what do you mean by revelation from god that he uh either directly gave it to I, a prophet or he inspired the writing of okay. a prophet or whoever else he chose specifically usually prophets or uh in the new testament apostles so when we read Romans, what ex which what are we reading? Are we reading Paul's opinions adopted by God as authoritative, or are we reading a dictation of what God told Paul? Uh, we are reading uh, 
Paul's writing of what has been revealed to him. Okay, so these are Paul's it matter. words. They're Paul's words, but they've right, been directly words, revealed to him. Right. So this is Paul's understanding of what was revealed to him. Well, yeah, but he... Okay. Are you, are you questioning the, the validity of an apostle? I, I, I'm i not unequivocally just accepting things I mean, just you, because we say things. We say what? Well, you're saying that Paul was an apostle, and you're you're drawing some conclusion as a result of that, that everything Paul says is true because he's, he said it. If it's in the scriptures, it's been attested to by the other apostles, the church. I mean, heck, where Peter, does, where does, he, he, I'm going to tell you, Peter acknowledges Paul's writings are scripture. Well, he agrees that some of Paul's writings are scripture. Okay. And are you saying, are, okay, if you're going to sit here and what, tell me what, that, what, if you're going to sit here and tell me that scripture, uh, the word of God. Now, if you're going to well, tell script- me that Romans two, look, you sound more like an atheist. I, I, I mean, I thought you trusted in Christ for righteousness, for, for salvation. And you you sound like a skeptic, a relative atheist. Well, I sound like a person who has rational thought. And so I'm just trying to understand how you understand Paul's writings. So Paul's writings. You, okay, are so it's not rational Paul's, for me. Hang on. It's not rational for me to see the scriptures as the word of God, as revealed the faith once and all delivered to the saints. And you want somebody to believe that this guy in 1800 got new revelation? And it's all uh, washes out everything else or whatever you want to say. Sure. Look, let's just look at, why don't we just look at, it's okay. That makes a lot of sense. Well, isn't, isn't that I what didn't Paul's come here doing? To look. Isn't that what Paul's no. doing with, with the law of Moses? He's washing it out and he's replacing Absolutely it with something else. Absolutely not. If, we, if you'd let us get to the text instead of questioning the validity of Paul, you would see this. I'm just trying to understand the validity of Paul from your perspective. So Paul writes a letter well, and you believe I'm dumbfounded that, that it's not the same validity from your perspective. He's an apostle with direct revelation from God and Christ Jesus himself. Paul is a person who wrote a text. And okay, you guys, believe the text is authoritative uh, because Paul Jordan, wrote it. And I, I'd be glad to I'm talk with you guys. To I would be glad to talk with you guys as as zealous uh, missionaries for uh, for your church. But I, I didn't come here to talk with a skeptic. I came here to talk about the gospel of Jesus I'm, Christ. I'm not a, I'm not a skeptic. You are I'm a skeptic. To, I'm not a skeptic. a skeptic. I'm trying to understand the difference between how you understand what Paul wrote and how I understand what Paul wrote because our understandings of scripture are different. So, for example, we we reject sola scriptura. We don't believe in that. Yeah, because if you didn't, you wouldn't be able to have the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great no, Price. No, we, we don't. Of the we don't believe in all in these that. other things. We don't believe in sola scriptura because it's a nonsensical doctrine that's not found anywhere it's in the biblical nonsensical. text. It's not nonsensical. Okay, it's not nonsensical. Then, then where where it is, is the found? Con- where is the doctrine Timothy, of sola scriptura? Found all scripture in the is breathed text? out by God, is profitable for. Uh, <laughs> Education, reproof, correcting, whatever he said, all of that. That's soul scripture. That's simply all it is. It ain't this that's biblicist. Not, that's not, not. That's not what Paul. That's not what Timothy. The, the letter is Timothy Paul is writing saying. to Timothy. It's that's actually not Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy wasn't written by Paul, but the the idea oh, okay. is okay, guys. I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you too. I'm not talking to a skeptic. I, I didn't come it's here. Not, to talk it's not to skeptic. A it's not skeptic. You, yes, this Paul. is textual. This is this is modern textual criticism, skepticism. Yes, it is. I know what this is. I, I'm not an idiot, dude. Are you sure? Listen. Well, there's I significant I evidence to talk, that, that Paul didn't write the pastoral epistles. It, that's you. I, I know you from, believe that they do. You're getting that from modern textual criticism. Hi textual criticism i know what this most is scho- I'm no, well- most scholar you know most scholars agree that with that i, I don't know not, it's not you textual. can't just say most scholars agree with that who are most, most evangelical scholars agree that they the pastoral not. epistles were not written by paul that's, that's not, not true. that's not controversial that's simply not true. yes it is okay that Dan- is simply daniel not wallace true. is yes i do yeah, daniel wallace doesn't think paul wrote the pastoral epistles
He don't. You don't. Think, he's Daniel Wallace. He says believes he didn't write, scripture. He believes there's scripture. But he, none he, of them. He agrees with mainstream scholars. None of the none but, of the thirteen. Daniel Wallace says that Paul wrote none of the thirteen. No. I'm not an idiot, dude. He said he didn't write the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus, but that's that's beside the point. The point is, is that in Timothy, there is not the doctrine of sola, sola scriptura found in Timothy, because in order to have sola scriptura, you would first have to have tota scriptura, which means no. the canon would have had to have been Those identified two... and closed. You can't Look, you can't have sola scriptura, because to claim you can't the, have the sola 66, scriptura. The 66 text of the biblical canon can't support such a doctrine. If you want to believe in sola scriptura, you're welcome to do that. Okay, we and, don't. In what, okay, in what way can they not support it? And we don't, we don't reject it because we're rejecting an obvious fact. We answer reject the, it answer, because it's not found what, anywhere. In what way can they not support the doctrine? They, they, where do they support it? You said where nowhere the in the 66 they can't support the doctrine. There is, there the, is no... There is no place in any of the biblical canon that says there's this canon is exclusively scripture and God's word. That's ridiculous. In fact, your your previous statement about Paul, if they taught you said that if if they had been taught a doctrine from Paul, then they would have understood it. That would mean that Paul is the authority in that context, not the text he's writing. So even in that text, you have a period of special revelation. Scholars like James White agree with that. During periods of special revelation, you can't have sola scriptura. But the, the claim is, is that that period of special revelation ceased, and you rely right. on the biblical text for that proposition. Where is that taught in the biblical text? Okay. I have an excellent idea. Let's change the subject. <laughs> Are, are you going to allow Paul to be uh, to be speak for himself in chapter two, or are you just going to keep on with your skepticism? If you have children, be sure to bury their heads in the sand before you bury your own. Can uh, we you can the, you can read you can read chapter two, sure. Uh, well, actually, is it, I don't know that it's going to be beneficial. Like, well, I'm not going to agree with your position on it if it disagrees. Then what do we do? Then what are we doing? Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to agree with your theological positions respecting the, the text. No. Then what are we even doing? We're we're having a discussion. I mean, if you're trying to convert me, that's not going to work out because we're not going to get converted to your belief system. Well, I'm not going to convert you as a skeptic because you you've already made up your mind. I haven't made I mean, up my dude, mind you, on, you, on anything. You are so hardened. Well, what you what you could do is you could you could support, for example, the doctrine of sola scriptura. You could show me where it's found in the biblical texts, where they outline that doctrine specifically, and and the and most I'm, okay. Other than Timothy, that all scriptures breathe out by well, God, it could, profitable. All scripture okay, can't mean the sixty-six texts. Okay, Bible, whatever. Okay, you've already you've already said that. Okay. Well, I mean, do you agree it's the with same that thing. position? Well, we can agree on things. Do you well, agree no, with you that can, position? No, because you no, was you've Paul already said you're not going to agree with anything I say. No, but no, wait, does Paul is Paul talking about texts that haven't been written yet? Or Listen, is he just talking about the text that they had? Is he only talking about he, the Hebrew the, scriptures? Okay, at the time he was he most talking likely, about at the time he was probably talking about the Hebrew scripture. Right. And if he was doing that, then he's saying all scripture is given, which means it's just talking about the Hebrew Bible, which means the Greek New Testament is not that scripture. Was, okay, all scripture at that time. But that time has passed. I know. I just said that. I know you just said that. Okay, I, I, I'm not sure where you're going with well, this. Well, I'm not sure where you're going with this. That's what I just said. Well, that's what I'm saying to you. All right? Right. And, 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 and Hebrews says, long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers and the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, who appointed uh, heir of all things, uh, so forth and, and so on. What does that have that, to do with sola scriptura? That has to do with the closing of the canon. Hebrews this closed is a the final, canon? No. Christ coming and his apostles closed the canon. When did, I know, but you're saying that that occurred, but that text in Hebrews doesn't have anything to do with that. Yes, it does. 
God it's saying, it's times saying in that diverse places hasn't times fact spoken through the prophets has in these last days spoken through his son. Right. In that these last days spoken through his son. And it's now we have all. Well, we first of all, well, first of all, the author of Hebrews is unknown. Secondly, that has nothing certainly, to do with it. Has it, no, it, 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 it does. Who, it does. It does. Because if the text is apostolic and authoritative, we should know who wrote it. Otherwise, we're just taking a text because we like what it says and throwing it into the canon. Who wrote who wrote Hebrews? Paul's writings are you're saying a scripture because Paul wrote them, but who wrote Hebrews? Jordan fades back, swoosh, and that's the game. You know as well as I do that it's not a definitive who wrote Hebrews. No, I don't. And neither do you. So Let's okay, just throw out Hebrews. Okay, let's throw out Hebrews. Let's throw out Hebrews. Okay, who so, wrote, so who Hebrews, wrote Philemon? Hebrews, Should we throw out Philemon too? Let's see. Uh, let's throw out Titus. I don't know. Who, I mean, I mean, let's throw that out. Timothy. Well, I mean, we know, that's, that's not. We my know position. Dan Wallace said that Paul didn't write Timothy, so believe, let's throw those that, out. I believe the uh, text scripture. Let's see. Well, who believe, wrote Alma? Who wrote Alma? Let's throw that out. Well, Alma this is ridiculous. Do we want to look? Do we want to look at what Paul said or not? Or do you want to keep? skirting around it and keep us no. from getting to the meat of what he said all righty then no the the meat of the discussion is as if if we're talking past one another if we're talking about things and we're trying to reach an agreement you're getting quite heated about this and i'm not sure why we're trying to discuss things it's because you're not allowing you're not allowing us to get to what the whole point I, of this whole thing i am not accepting some of the presuppositions that you're espousing i don't accept what them presuppositions? I don't accept them so for example that paul wrote if, romans that he was authoritative because he had the Holy right. Spirit and revelation from Jesus. Right. Then, Those are then all there's no point in even... that you hold. Let's talk about them. Well, what's wrong wanna... with, if we, if we can't hold to that, then why are we even here? Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's going to die. So, so in order for you to make a point, people have to already conclude that your points are valid. Is that your position? No, no. If we, so if this, okay. no, have, no, no, have no, 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 no. We're not, dude. This is not the same thing. If I was talking to an atheist, I'd be talking about metaphysics. This is not the same thing. We're talking about revelation from God that decides our doctrine and our belief on whether or not we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. We have to have from God. we have right. to have an authority, right? Otherwise, we're just floating in the wind and we don't know anything. Right. And so, from Latter Day Saints, the authority that we receive is the same authority that you indicated that Jesus gave to the apostles, which we currently have in the church today. There are prophet and our twelve that's apostles, a, and that's continuing revelation does not demean nor discredit existing revelation. The Bible is the word of God. It is always identified first in our canon, our standard works. Indeed, it was a divinely ordained encounter with the fifth verse of the first chapter of the book of James that led Joseph Smith to his vision of the Father and the Son, which in turn gave birth to the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our time. I testify that the heavens are open. I testify that the presence of such authorized prophetic voices and ongoing canonized revelations have been at the heart of the Christian message whenever the authorized ministry of Christ has been on the earth. In our heartfelt devotion to Jesus of Nazareth as the very Son of God, the Savior of the world, we invite all to examine what we have received of Him to join with us, drinking deeply at the well of water, springing up into everlasting life. And I can that's see him authority. say, that, and that's I can see authority. him say, and I can see him say, that's just a presupposition. I'm willing to go to your text. Right. I'm willing that's to right. go. I'm willing to go to your text and say, look, it says this, and I and look, this is. I agree. This is right. You can't be unclean and inherit the kingdom of heaven. Okay. But when I go to the text of Paul. We want to have skepticism. It's not reliable. We don't know who wrote it. Oh, uh, no, what is your I, presupposition? I I'm, not, I'm not questioning who wrote Romans. I know Paul wrote Then why Romans. don't you let Paul speak for himself? 
Okay, go ahead and read I, Paul. I started out by trying to explain. No, it's because you indicated universal, that the universal morality from God. Peyton, Peyton, you started off laying a foundation that the biblical texts are an authority. They're God's word. They're the they foundation. Are. I disagree with that presupposition. That's what. That's why I stated what I did. I'm not disagreeing that Paul wrote Romans. What I'm trying to determine is, is the text authoritative or was Paul authoritative? Because earlier you stated that if Paul taught something to somebody, they absolutely understood that doctrine. The re hey, right. Okay. Here's the reason but I said but, that. But here's the problem. No, but stop. Let me answer you wait. at least once. But the reason I said that is it. because the reason I said that is because he's in their presence and he can explain and expound further. Ding ding ding! What do we have for Johnny? That's right. That's it's obvious. They don't understand the text. Paul is there to correct the problem. That's the point I was making. Okay. Paul is writing a text. If they don't understand the text which is possible, if they don't get it, Paul is there to explain it. Or if Paul's not there, one of the other so, apostles is so there. So now, now we're going it. to a place where I have to have Paul sitting in front of me to know what Paul and means. Then, and then earlier so do I have you to have Paul, Do I have to have Paul sitting in front of me to know what he meant? And early, to, Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Then why are we here? I don't know discussing. anything. I don't know anything. You don't know anything. We don't have Paul sitting here. So what do we? No, even I'm doing? here to tell you that there is a Paul. There is somebody with the same authority as Paul living today. Well, just as in ancient times, the role of an apostle today is to be a special witness of Christ's name to God's children. They teach, baptize, and bear witness of the Savior and the reality of His resurrection from the dead. They continue to travel throughout the world, spreading the light of gospel knowledge to all nations. In the Bible, Jesus spoke to his apostles and taught, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. This means that God loves his children, and by following the principles and teachings of Jesus Christ taught through his prophets and apostles, his children can receive salvation and live again with him and their Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, that's We have a prophet and 12 apostles today. Christ okay. has called them today. Let's end it here. So if, uh, you, and I, if you and I disagree about the interpretation of Romans, who do we appeal to? I appeal to the scripture. Right. To, you're just going to, you're engaging in circular logic. You're that's not circular back to logic. Your interpretation of the scriptures. No, 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 no. The scripture interpretate, interprets itself. The scripture is one story revealed from God. You know what? The, 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 and the it's scripture, consistent. By scripture, you mean the biblical text. And by biblical text, you mean an anthology of 66 okay. documents. Oh, I suppose so. That have been put together. Let me don't use Genesis to interpret Paul. You don't use well, Matthew then, uh, well, to well, interpret well, then, Revelation. Yes, you do, because uh, every single section of these letters from Paul, Jude, uh, Peter, John, James, what do they do constantly? They reference the old text. They, they reinterpret the, the ancient texts in a modern oh, they context for their re listeners. Well, yeah, that's okay. what they did. So, so okay. they're not being honest they, to the text. Here, we can agree on this. Okay. In the first century, what did what were the Jews expecting as a messianic figure? Uh, they, were, they were expecting a ruling king to come in and take out the Romans. Right. So they misunderstood their own text, correct? Yeah, right. Okay. So Jesus comes along and he reinterprets those texts for them so that they can understand that he is actually the expectation, not a, a king or something else that they were expecting. Okay. And then the apostles and Jesus's other followers that wrote the other texts right. continue that process of reaching back into the Hebrew scriptures and reinterpreting them for their Jewish and, and Gentile listeners so that they can understand that the Hebrew scriptures are not to be interpreted the way the Pharisees and the Sadducees were interpreting okay. them. They're reinterpreting right. them. We can agree on that, can't we? Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's what the you purpose mean by of, reinterpret. of a prophet. 
A prophets uh, and right. apostles. Now, that's what's what they the do. They take ancient texts and they this, reinterpret them. This is them going in, a way in the it's direction. Contextual. This could take you in a whole other direction that is not intended. But there's a specific qualification for apostle. That they're called by God. No. Okay, what's the specific requirement? They they had to witness Christ resurrected. Did what, they not? what does that mean? You every apostle apostle had to be someone who had a firsthand experience with Christ resurrected on the earth when he what when do you he mean by earth, that? When he walked the earth after his resurrection and appeared to them five hundred times or whatever it was over the next forty days. That was so, an experience. That's a, that was so when Paul they when they said qualify. when they yes he does because he had Why <laughs> Christ he appeared to him because according Christ to appeared who? to him according to Paul. Well, duh. And or according right. to Luke, so according Act, no, to, no, actually, according to Luke and Acts. So well, according to well, and and he got that story from Paul, presumably, correct? Because he wasn't there. I assume. Right, he wasn't there to witness the other Paul's apostles vision. accepted him, accepted him up, 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 upon that standard, right? But Based their standard claim, when they, they replaced Judas, claim. when they replaced Judas, that was their standard with Matthias, yeah. But that apparently wasn't the standard with Paul because Paul wasn't among them, Paul was an apostate, according Paul to their perspective. Encountered the resurrected Christ, right? On Are the you road saying to Damascus, didn't? okay, he did. And he, well, he encountered According even another... to Paul, he did. Yes. According to Paul, he <sighs> saw the resurrected Christ. Or he saw a light and heard a voice, or he heard a voice and saw a light, depending on which, which story you're believing in Acts, because Acts contradicts itself. But the point is, is that he conveyed that story to the author of Luke Acts, right? And the other apostles... That, that person wasn't there. And, the and then other... he told the other apostles, and they accepted the and... story. So you think that if... If Paul was lying, God's just going to allow that. When I'm he not struck saying Paul at, was when, lying. Well, then you're I'm implying just, that you're implying that it couldn't, it could possibly not be true. Well, you stated that they would have had to have had an experience with with Jesus's resurrection. I guess you that just was mean a vision of Jesus, just That's a vision of Jesus. Well, that he experienced Jesus as a resurrected. Okay, so experiencing Jesus as a resurrected being, there's no specificity to that, correct? Yeah, there is. Paul's vision isn't like, exactly specific. Physically experienced him. He spoke to him. He told him, I'm Jesus. He heard a voice and saw a light, whatever that means. So you're telling me he didn't? I'm just saying what the text says. I, I'm just Do trying you, to understand. You say that there's a specific qualification. It doesn't seem that Paul there, reached it according to your definition. He, I'm telling you he did. He, okay. he encountered Christ resurrected. Right. You're, so uh, uh, are you denying that? So you actually have to see Jesus visit you. That was their qualification for apostle. Joseph, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Okay, well, and Joseph Smith meets that as well. Oh, my. And so what does about Oliver the, Cowdery. And, uh, so what, who's your guy right now? When did he see Jesus? When did Jesus meet him in the resurrected all, body? All of the prophets in the biblical text saw Jesus? Yes. No, all the apostles, apostles. We're talking about apostles so, here. Is there a dif difference between an apostle and a prophet? Yes. What's the difference? The office of apostle came after Christ's resurrection. The apostle was the uh, agent to spearhead the spreading of the Great Commission. Well, they have a they have a different function in the sense that they're teaching a different message than the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. Or a prophet is simply someone speaking on God, or speaking for God, whether they're speaking from the Scriptures or they're speaking from direct revelation. I mean, a prophet oh. could be a preacher, right? But, so President Nelson qualifies under that qualification as a prophet, uh, as a preacher, or as a direct revelation. Well, as a direct revelation, he receives a direct revelation from God. Okay. Like currently, yeah. Okay. You want to talk about somebody being skeptical? I'll join you in your skepticism on that. We still haven't got to what well, Paul said. Well, that's fine. 
I, I, I don't know what basis you would have because that's the consistent pattern in the biblical text of God speaking through prophets. Okay. All right. I have an excellent idea. Let's change the subject. <laughs> Where we were originally. My goodness. 45 minutes. What I was saying when we got so sidetracked was this that uh I, I don't Paul says Paul says that uh all people have received their conscience bears witness to this. Uh let me find the specific section. All right. All right. For all who have sinned without the law also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not the hearers of the law, but the doers. All right. For when Gentiles do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves. This is what I mean by a universal moral code that is, as Paul says here, um, they show I, that I the do. work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears what, witness. What does that specifically mean? I didn't understand that. It means that uh, we know certain things are wrong, whether we even acknowledge God or not. It doesn't matter what your theological beliefs are. And, or and by law. Beliefs. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. What? Oh, oh. By law, what's he talking about in that in that passage? He's talking about uh, the Gentiles the general... who have not the law. Yeah, he's well, he's he could he's talking about the full law that was uh, revealed to the Jews. But the law represents something foundational, does it not? It represents where, God's where does moral it say? character. I, I don't know. Paul doesn't it, it, he hasn't explained what that means yet. So I don't know in the text what law he's talking about. OK, let me go back and see if he says. Uh, he said, because remember, there's only one way to interpret this text, correct? All right, so it must be incredibly clear. What are we clear? Yes, sir. Are we clear, Crystal? Without the law, okay, and which law? All right, hang on. A few minutes later. Okay, he doesn't specify before that, but we can in we, if we use context clues and uh, we should be able to figure this out. Well, I yeah, I, I don't or, know how or, we would if he doesn't use without, context clues or describe what the law is. Okay, without without the law, uh, also perish without the law. Okay, now. For Gentiles who do not have the law. So well, which is Gentiles no Gentiles. No Gentiles <laughs> have the law if we're talking about the law of Moses. Right. That's what he's saying. They don't have the written law of Moses, but they have a law that is on their heart, their conscience. There are certain moral things that they know and understand that are not right. But the law of that's, Moses that's wasn't why. entirely a moral code, though. The law of Moses had had a series of provisions. So what specifically is he talking about with respect follow, to the law? Follow me here. The law of Moses, whether it's the the uh, civic law or the actual moral law, the Ten Commandments, you got ceremonial law. All these are revelations of who God is morally. You understand, Most Peyton, that... The, most, why that would be most, confusing to somebody, right? Because if it's talking about the law, it's talking about pieces of it, portions no, of it, all of it. 
what's he excluding? The bottom line what's is this. Including? The bottom line is this: is it's God's morality. Is the is the if Paul's going to get to this if we let him? He he's he's trying to tell us here that the law, what it is, ain't rules that get you right with God. Well, it the, is to yeah, show well, then, us. It is to show us our standing before God and our sin. The law. Paul tells us if we if you would let us instead of being a skeptic of everything that Paul says and and you're I, trying I, to not, you're trying to I, undercut you're trying to undercut the scripture by not allowing the scripture to speak. I, and, I'm asking you. You're saying law. It says law. I'm asking you what law Paul's referring to. Well, I've just you can told tell you. Tell me, or you, you can you can tell you me. Can or you can start it. So far, he hasn't said. Uh, the law of the uh the civic law of the of the jews and the right, israelites he's not talking, in the, so he's talking about yeah. some nondescript non-specific law right because it's okay. under because he's going to get to that where he's he's going to paint the picture that the law is a picture of god's righteousness there must be some context that the romans had that we don't because he's writing to them as though they understand what he's meaning and I'm wondering if you know that context and where you get it. Because if I'm going to just read the text and think Paul speaks clearly, then I can't just infer or guess or, or interpret. Because you stated earlier that we're just going to read what Paul says and it'll be clear. I'm asking you what law. And then you said, if the Gentiles don't have the law, and you're talking about the law of Moses, the Gentiles don't have the law of Moses. And the law of Moses is a comprehensive He legal says they system. don't have the law. Right, I understand that, but so they can't be expected to follow a law that's never been delivered to them, certainly. But they're doing the provisions of the law because it's written on their hearts? No, he says, are there parts, are there things in the law, okay, are there things in the law that people do, this is kind of a general standard, lying, stealing, murder, rape, are there things morally that people generally adhere to? No matter is if he they talking even about that, is he talking about that, or is he talking about something with respect to a specific legal code or law? He's talking about that. Where, where does it say that, though? Right where are here, you getting he that says, that's what he's talking he about. He says, he's okay. What are the Gentiles? What are the Gentiles doing? I want you to explain to me then, if if there's any other way to interpret this. What are, the, what are the laws that the Gentiles are keeping that are a judgment to themselves and their conscience uh, bears witness to it? I don't have any idea. Okay, then. I do. It's, the, okay. it's more and, and I'm asking you where you got that. Where, you get, where did you get that answer? Because if you would let us get to the rest of what Paul says, well, he then, tells then, us. Then, well, what, it, then if he tells us later on, then I guess go further in the text and show okay. me, I guess. I mean, <sighs> if he... I assumed you said you knew this really well. I figured if you, if it says it later, you could just flip to it and say, well, in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, it says it right there. What it is well, talking about the law of Moses. My, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I assume that when we get to it, you're going to say, well, that's not good enough. You're going to be like, well, that's just your assumption or your presupposition. And uh, well, you're if, just going to be skeptical if the, if the about answer it. is something like law means what I say it means, even though I can't point anywhere in the text where it says that, then yes, I'm going to be skeptical of that. Okay, if the Gentiles don't have the law, then what law could it be? I have no idea. Oh, my gosh. How can you read anything and learn anything with this mindset? Not Because just sometimes I, I mean, read... Some... I mean, how can you read anything? How do you read the newspaper and know well, what you're reading? Well, when I'm reading a 2,000-year-old document that was written originally in Greek in a different, entirely different context, socially and culturally... You have to do a significant amount of study into the social and cultural context of that people, that time, and that language. And so then you, you have to try to interpret the text based on that if you're going to do it from a scholarly perspective. Or you have to impose your modern context in which so you nobody, should not understand nobody can Nobody can read the scripture without being uh, super scholarly uh, and, and glean anything from the scriptures. Well, like an average person, an average per, average person couldn't read the scripture and learn anything. Well, they could read and learn stuff. 
but they're going like to apply what? their own. Well, they're they're going to apply their own cultural definition to the English words they're reading. And if you know, many Christians, for example, have no idea what languages the biblical texts were even written in. And most most of my talk to they think it was all written in Hebrew. They have no idea the New Testament was written in Greek. They have no idea that it was written by more Does than that one stop author. Them from learning anything. Well, it, it can stop them from understanding it's it like correctly. A, it's kind of like the question you had earlier about if somebody doesn't completely understand justification, are they not saved? Well, that's, you, that's a different think, question. Do you think the revelation of God is that esoteric that the average person is not meant to get it? Because that's, that's actually very similar to the church, uh, the, the Rome. I mean, that's basically Rome's stance. What's Rome's stance? Oh, that the, the masses can't quite understand the scripture. We have to tell them what it, what it means. I don't know that that's necessarily incorrect. Most people don't understand the biblical text. That's a that's a huge problem. Biblical illiteracy is becoming an increasingly well, big problem in today's problem world. So, for example, the, the bigger people, problem people, is people don't people, read it and they think. Well, they people accept it. doctrines like sola scriptura and they just believe that they're just clearly found in there, and then they'll quote Timothy or they'll quote Hebrews chapter one. And then when you actually say, okay, it doesn't say that in there, they go, okay, it doesn't say that in there, but that's what I think it says anyway. And so I, I don't like the like the doctrine of the Trinity, Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. It's well, not found anywhere doctrine, in the biblical. You got it's not found anywhere the, in the biblical text either. You got the doctrine of the Trinity right here in doctrine doctrines and covenant. We don't have any. We don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not found well, anywhere you, in our scriptures. It's, written it's not found anywhere there. in any scriptures, so it can't be found in any of our scriptures. Oh, okay. Well, it says uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. Yeah, but that's not referring to co-substantiality. It's referring to the same thing as in John 17. It's talking about unity. Oh. So because that's the only, only God? Because Alma just said there's no other God. I know, and he's talking about the God of Israel because he's he's speaking in a context that's prior to the incarnation. No, that's not what he said. How do you know that's what he meant? Because if you keep reading the Book of Mormon, it explains that. There's nothing the Book about of Mormon. Multiple, there's nothing the book about of Mormon, multiple gods the book, in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is an actual book, unlike the biblical texts, which are a collection yeah, of texts and anthology. The, okay, okay. The Book of Mormon let's continues to, on, and it has go to Christ. The, show me in the Book Christ. of Mormon. Tell me the place in the Book of Mormon where the doctrine of multiple gods is. It's in 3 Nephi chapter 11, where... It, it, well, it's actually the like 10 chapters after that as well. You've got Jesus, who is God, talking to, praying to, and acknowledging his father, who had previously identified him as a divine being. The, the New Testament texts are pretty clear on that as well. Jesus has a father. He's the God of Israel, and he has a father and a God. That's two gods, no, he, at least. He, okay. Because the biblical we're, we're texts aren't monotheistic. Well, why aren't we going to get into that? Because it's not you, you, it's nonsense. And uh, why is it nonsense? Gonna, you, are you going to bring this same this same thing about uh, the the Hebrews, the Israelites were not monotheistic? Everybody, there's no monotheism anywhere in the Bible. There is only one God rhetoric, which is intended to emphasize the incomparability of our God in comparison to the insignificance of the other gods. Uh, the text acknowledges the existence of other gods from beginning to end, and in certain circumstances, we can demonstrate that other gods were even worshipped. No, the, the ancient Hebrews were not monotheistic. Okay. They couldn't well, have we're, been. Not, we're not dealing with that. Of course. How selfish of me. Let's do all the things that you want to do. Well, they couldn't have been. Why, why are they, why are they why? worshiping other gods of other nations? Why are they being called to worship the God of Israel? Why is Israel's God, you're talking which about is a geographic people, You're deity. talking about people falling away and leaving Yahweh to do other for another people God. Do that, people do that all the time. That doesn't for mean another, that they... Well, for another God that they don't believe exists... Alrighty then. They don't believe anything because they they're falling away. The ones you're talking if I, about. If I was worshiping you, you the God of Israel, no, you can't conflate. You can't. No, 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 no. You can't conflate faithful Israelites with some people that just did whatever. 
Now, some folks are going to push back and say, no, no, that's just the apostates. That's not the faithful ones because the authoritative texts say so. And I want to give you an analogy to demonstrate how misleading that is. Let's imagine 2,000 years from now, historians uncover the Declaration of Independence and they read, all men are created equal. But they also uncover a bunch of uh, material remains that indicate a lot of early Americans owned slaves and didn't let women vote or own property. Are those historians justified in saying, well, look at their authoritative text. The people who wrote this obviously didn't do that. Only the apostate Americans did that. The faithful ones believed all men were created equal. Well, faithful you Israelites maintained their maintained worship of the God of Israel. But then there were eight, there were other Israelites who worshiped other gods. And you're saying and they, collectively, and they some of them, you're saying some of them believed that there was no okay. other God in existence. Well, Listen, others the of them acknowledge that, the existence of other deities and worship other, those deities. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that's the doctrine of uh, of the Israelites. Well, oh, really? Well, it reflects that the biblical texts are not monotheistic. It means the Israelites were not monotheistic because they believed in other gods. That's pretty clear in the text. I'm not sure why you're having an issue with that. Well, the issue is you're, you're using people who were not uh, adhering to the teaching of their prophets right they, they believe to, to be the to be the knowledge. standard of their doctrine and that you right. you you can do that with nobody you can't say well the standard of their doctrine and what they actually believe is based on the people who aren't listening to their prophets you can't do that no the understanding of how no people that's what you do based on how they act okay so if if a group of israelites let's let, let's just do this let's just do if, this if israel let's just falls do this. into romans 3 paul says uh he says this and if you want to check me go read it guys jordan i beg y'all to go read romans three and four okay romans three he says you we are all uh sinful we have all transgressed god's law no one keeps the law not one he also tells us that the law is a teacher to show us our sin that's what paul says if you want to, I'm just going to, I'm going to paraphrase Paul. And if you want to check it, go check it and see if I'm wrong. Okay. No one's righteous. No, not one in Romans three and Romans four. This is the, well, this except, is where the rubber, for Jesus of Nazareth, this, right? This is where the rubber hits the road. That's right. So Jesus of Nazareth and Abraham, Abraham, uh, no, Abraham. Well, we're fixing to get to Abraham. What then shall we say? uh was gained by abraham our forefather according to the flesh for if abraham was justified by works he has nothing he has something to boast but not before god right he didn't pay wages for his grace for what does scripture say abraham believed god and it was counted to him as righteousness one of the one of the ones that I always think of when people talk about univocality is faith and works we have in Romans 3 and 4 we have Paul talking about faith and works. And in Romans 3.28, he says that uh, we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And, uh, and then just a few verses later in Romans 4.3, Paul brings up Abraham and said, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. In James chapter 2, we have uh, an interesting discussion where James talks about faith without works being dead. And James also quotes that passage uh, in Genesis, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. But James doesn't say that we're, not, we're justified by faith apart from works. James says Abraham was justified by works, and that is what fulfilled that statement that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then in the next verse... James say, says, thus we see a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so folks like Martin Luther and many others read James as directly disagreeing with Paul. And I think originally he was doing that intentionally, quoting Paul and disagreeing with him, saying, no, that's not accurate. But this gets harmonized, it gets reread, and obviously for Protestants, um, sola gratia, faith, faith alone, that is one of the central doctrines of uh, Protestant Christianity. And so because of that, the Romans passages are going to take priority. The mm. James passages 
must then be reread in order to bring them into alignment in order to maintain the univocality of the text. And so then we have this idea that James is not saying works are necessary for salvation. James is saying if your faith is adequate, works will be the fruit of <laughs> your faith. And so it's putting the cart before the horse because James is not saying, hey, everybody have faith and then you'll know you have faith because then these works will start sprouting out everywhere. James is saying your faith needs works in order to progress. And he explicitly says that by works is faith perfected. Right, because he obeyed God. That's how you demonstrate belief because in he, the divine being is by obeying right. No, 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 no. He, it doesn't say he obeyed God and he was counted righteous. It says he believed God. Now, what right. did he do? By now, acting what did, out what God told him to do. No, 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 no. He believed okay, God. Okay, so Abraham didn't do what God told him to do. Listen, what did he believe? Whatever God told him, and then he acted no, 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 it no. out. Specifically in this moment, what was Abraham believing? I, I don't know. What's the context he believed, of Paul's? He believed that God would provide. He believed God's promise that he would bless the nations through his offspring, right? Okay. So believing and, God and, would be a righteous and God thing said, in God said, God said, go. Okay. He said, go and sacrifice Isaac. He still believed God in that promise, right? Yeah. He because believed he, that God, he believed that God would provide. That's what he believed, right? What was it, what was Abraham's reaction when he was told that he would have Isaac in his in his older years? That's that's before this point. That doesn't matter. Okay. This is the moment he believed. This is the moment that he had full faith in God. Now he did. Dem he did. Well, he right. believed. He yeah. If I believe, he demonstrated God, that faith. If God had been faithful in keeping his commandments and covenants with me up to that point, and I continue to believe him, the act of believing a promise he's making to me would be a righteous thing to do, certainly. Yeah, but he, he's the, the, uh, the act, right, of actually taking Isaac up the hill was the demonstration, yeah. was a demonst demonstration of the faith. But the faith, right. it doesn't say when I, the act made abraham righteous it says he believed god what? And, it, and he was counted righteous it was okay. accounted to him for righteousness yes right so what is that accounted it's mean? it's righteous to believe god that's a righteous act <laughs> right is it is but, it not yeah but it was counted to him as righteousness <laughs> Not just, oh, that's a good thing. Oh, that's a good thing he believed God. Meaning meaning what? It was counted to him for righteousness. Okay, that's it's that's a righteous thing. It's counted to me for righteousness when I do what well, God tells me. All right, me let's to. keep going. When, if Abraham I believe, believe what God, God tells me, if I do okay. what God tells me, I, now, I'm doing righteous now to things. The one Those who, things are going to be accounted to, to me as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are counted, are, uh, counted as not as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. Here's justification. Justification has now entered the picture. Wait, wait, wait. Believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. If, if you believe that God will justify you through the work of Christ, that faith, that belief is your righteousness. That faith is what cleanses you. That is the righteousness of Christ being counted to you. No. Yes. Okay, you can believe that. That's not what we believe. No, I, I, that's that's what it is. It's not whether or not I believe it. This is what Paul is telling us. Just as David. Yeah, uh, if you ignore speaks, if you ignore the the previous verses you stated, sure you can come up with that. What previous verse? What what, what well, am I having to ignore? Paul is making a distinction between earning earning something through wages. Right. It's the difference between the 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 Greek doctrine of charis. That's exactly and what he's doing. Yeah, that's it's exactly a difference. Right. There's a difference between an earned wage and something that's given to you by grace, which right. is not an earned wage. Yeah, right. he's making that distinction. Yeah, exactly. Right. But you're not rendered righteous as a result of a one-time act. No. No, it's not the act. It's Christ that makes you righteous. Guys, nothing that we do. Yeah, we can't. The, through, we don't do anything to inherit the kingdom of God. Now we live as right, a response through the, to through that. the process. So the process of sanctification. Yes, you. No, 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 no. Christ we, makes no, no, you no, no. righteous. No, Christ made you righteous on the cross, sir, or whoever believes. No, we don't believe in forensic cross. justification. So, 
We're, we're aware of the, the doctrine of forensic justification. Oh, they're now you're us, aware we, we reject of it. it. Okay. We're, we, we reject it, and we don't so, have a yeah, term you reject for that. The, we don't listen, use that term. The imputation we, we of righteousness. In, we don't believe in the, imputed righteousness. Yeah, right, exactly. That's the whole sticking point. It's not a biblical Guys, doctrine. Okay. Listen. I pray for all of you. I pray for myself that we don't presume that we can fulfill God's righteousness. Okay, we don't Christ, think that. Only, yes, you do. No, Christ we don't. Fulfilled, Christ fulfilled the righteousness. So you know nothing about LDS theology, but you're telling us what you we just do told and believe. Me, you just told me you deny this central aspect of the gospel. So right. yes, and, and, I know and what you, you just, you just told, told me. And you just told me that what you're doing is imposing your own understanding on the text. Because you no, stated no, no. earlier that the texts are not clear. There's I can say the same. The no, I can say the same thing to you. You're of imposing course you your can. own understanding. Of course so you that can. gets us nowhere. Yeah, that gets us that nowhere. The, yeah, I know it gets us nowhere. So how do we reconcile that? The Holy Spirit has to do it. Right. A subjective feeling that we both have has to tell it's us. Not a feeling. Or, or no, no, no. like the first century Christians, we can go to the prophet that God called. No, the the it's not it's Holy Spirit. It's not a subjective feeling. It's not. So you work out sanctification by the how does, power how of the Holy the, Spirit. How does the Holy you, Spirit? Ob- you work out. How does sancti- the Holy Spirit objectively tell you what the text means? You. Well, we're waiting. Work out. Uh, well, it, it's called illumination. It. It's very similar to right. Revelation, Which, except right. it's not direct speaking. Well, I've been illuminated that what you're saying is not accurate and correct. Okay. It's not consistent yeah, with Paul's teaching. Well, it is. Nope. So I, I where, does, where, is it, where is it inconsistent? Because you're talking about, about it's, it's imputed righteousness. It's the idea that Christ simply covers you, even in your filthy state. Which is specifically what Alma is telling Amulek is not the case. Exactly. We're not saved that's, that's in our sins. We must exactly actually be that. cleansed. We must actually be and cleansed by we Christ. Are cleansed. Yes, and that and is a he, process. His work cleansed us, not us. No, 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 no. You said by Christ, but that's a process that we're supposed to do. No, sir. Christ did it all. Christ paid it all. Christ did all the work. Now we live in response to that and we show faith. We show that faith with works, perfectly valid. James 2, perfectly valid. We, we we're justify our process claim. Of, yeah, we're sanctified. Yeah, sancti- the sanctification. Of yeah, sanctification. It's a process. Absolutely. Huh. And that's by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we are not made right by God. With it, Sanctification does not make us right with God. Christ yes, did that. Christ did that. No, no, no. Sanctification no man, cleans us because no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of God. What you're saying is why is, is Paul so concerned about you having something to boast about if if you do it through sanctification? Why would I boast and, about that? And because you're doing you're you're the one making yourself right. No, you're I'm doing not. so good. Walking the path. You're walking the no, path. I'm not. And you can't get to the end of the path. So how are you sanctified if you can't get to the end of the path? Because I realize I can't get to the end of the path. And then uh, what are you relying on then? Grace. How are you clean? Right. That's the grace of Christ's work. Christ Christ fulfilled that grace. Christ engages in a process of sanctification that takes longer than this life to accomplish. Okay. Well, that's going off in the whole something else, going longer than this life. But sanctification, you, it does not say that Abraham was sanctified and counted righteous it says Abraham so if a, if a, if a terrible person in, if a if a terrible person who is violating whatever the law is that you believe is written on the hearts of gentiles if he's violating that law the thing he knows is good he's not doing it and he and he's a sinner according to your understanding of that up until the day of his death and then on his deathbed he accepts jesus what happens to him if he actually is born again then he's justified Okay, so while as he's dying, he's like, "I believe Jesus. Please come into my heart. Well, Save you me from no, my sins." You don't, he, no, that's he not is, how. That's not how being born again. Born again isn't. I believe Jesus. Please come into my heart. Jesus told Nicodemus, "You must be born again by the Spirit." 
Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You, it's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from, where it's going, but you hear it. Being born again is not just, oh, I, well, let's oh, say he I had that, Jesus now. Right, so he has that experience, whatever that yeah, is. He's, that he's happens. justified. And then 10 minutes later, he dies. He's justified. Okay, so he's just a filthy sinner who's never been cleansed of sin. He was cleansed. Who dies, cleansed and Jesus on, saves him. He was cleansed Jesus on saves the cross. him in his sins. No, Jesus cleansed him on the cross. Jesus saves him in his sins. Look, uh, when it's talking, when Paul's talking about propitiation here, and you're going to really say that I'm pulling this one out of my tail, but we're going to go through it anyway. When it says that he, um, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, there we go again. All who believe, for there is no distinction. That's the distinction between uh, Jew and Greek. For all have sinned, all fallen short of the glory of God, all are justified by his grace a, as a gift, okay? Justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of Christ Jesus, whom God puts forward as a propitiation, an atonement by his blood to, receive, uh, to be received by faith, okay? This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So that... Uh, you can say that I'm, I'm just making this up or whatever, but I'm going to tell you what that means. Passed over former sins. This is talking about Abraham. This is talking about everyone who had faith in God and believed God for that righteousness. It, it's not Peyton. Before, it's just saying whatever it says. Not, well, that's what it's saying. But his it divine what forbearance. Says. What is his divine so forbearance? So anything. It, what yeah, is any, divine forbearance? I don't know. What's divine, divine forbearance? What is it? Where divine is that for, described? Forbearance. Is where is the doctrine knowledge, of divine forbearance? It's not a doctrine, it's a state, text. it's a statement. Divine forbearance. Forbearance is what? Which is what? Which is forbearance. What, what forbearance is divine forbearance? Is knowing what is to come. God knows his divine forbearance. He forbears the this act of Christ coming, living and fulfill all righteousness, and dying on the cross. Okay. That that's why he so if he passed over former sins without that. He wouldn't be just. God's not just if he did. That He's just passing over sins just for the heck of it. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not following work. what you're saying. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe, you can, maybe you can follow it eventually. God knows his plan that we don't know at the time, that the Israelites, like you said earlier, they didn't know exactly what the plan was. It had to be revealed to them later. Was that Christ was going to fulfill this righteousness for those that he passed over in former time it says uh because in divine forbearance he passed over former sins it was it was to show his righteousness in the present time that is to mean it was to show that he is just because so that he might be the justifier uh hang on because there are former sins show the righteousness of the present time. He might be just so he might be just so he's proven that he is just he's not just looking over sin he's not just Okay, no, don't worry about it, guys. And the justifier, the one who has faith in Christ. There it is again, justifying the one who has faith in Christ. And Paul, I'm going to just go ahead and wrap this up. And you guys, uh, Jordan, y'all look at Romans. He starts chapter five by saying. It's okay, I explain it to him after we're off the phone. Sure. Since we have been justified by faith, guys, I pray for your soul. God, Father, I pray for the soul. I pray for your Holy Spirit to come on these guys and not be deceived by false prophets. We're, we're not deceived. We're not deceived by false doctrine, false prophets, because we don't believe you things have, that aren't found Father, in the Bible. So I'm going to wrap it up. Chapter five, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's okay. it. You have peace with God, now live like it. But you're so justified. you've done a very good job, Peyton. You're, just, you're you've justified been, by... You've been, you've been doing a very good job imposing upon us a paradigm we don't have 
and misunderstanding yeah. LDS theology. You've learned nothing because you haven't asked any questions. And we've oh, learned nothing because very you. little of what you said, very little of what you said made any sense. So um, I appreciate your time, though. Um, I'll have to now unravel the, what you said to the missionaries.